Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Social Science Speaker Series. We're really happy to see you all. Um, I'm Lorraine McNeil. I'm a faculty member in the School of Language and Liberal Studies, and I teach sociology and anthropology. And it is my great pleasure today to welcome our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Jenny Silcox. Uh, Jenny went to Western. She did her PhD in Western, and she taught here a little bit while she was doing that. And then she moved to Halifax and taught at Dalhousie for a couple of years, and now she's to our great joy has come back to London and she's back with us again, uh, teaching in the School of Public Safety and in Language and Middle Studies. And today she's going to be talking to you about uh, the images of males in the, in, uh, the media. And anyway, uh, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Jenny, Dr. Jenny Selkoff. Um, like I said, or like what was already said, my name is Jennifer Slowcox. What I'm doing today is I thought that I would take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about what I did during my PhD research and how my research has kind of taken a little bit of a detour and started looking at boys as well. When I initially started my PhD, I was only interested in looking at girls' representations of youth crime. But after <coughs> studying that for several years and getting completely sick of the topic, I suddenly realized I can look at boys too. And that actually in a lot of ways is probably uh, more interesting because it's a field that doesn't really get examined all too often. What I did was for this particular study, I did it alongside one of my colleagues at Western, Tracy Adams. And we looked through 1,100 news articles between 1991 and 2014 any time they mentioned something about youth crime. We ended up finding that yes, of course, uh, newspapers and crime, or sorry, crime rather, is gendered as male, uh, but the link between masculinity and youth crime is sometimes normalized, sometimes problematized, and sometimes completely hidden or obscured. The media discourses simultaneously reproduced and obscured gender and racial assumptions, and patterns of social inequality as marginalized men were depicted as being more dangerous to the very social fabric of Canadian society. So what I'm hoping when this works. can be gendered. Second, I hope that you'll start to question the accuracies of media reporting on youth crime. Next, I hope you'll appreciate media portrayals and how they can influence and reflect social inequality. And then lastly, I'll want you to consider a vision where crime reporting can be different or perhaps a little bit more reflective or contextual based. So in media accounts, we tend to see that there's this perception, this, car this perception that it's common knowledge that youth crime is, is rising, that crime in the United States and Canada is out of control. However, when we look to statistical evidence, we can very quickly see that the crime rates have been largely going down since the 1990s. And that despite that, we see the perception that it's going up we have it being tied to the idea that violent video games or popular culture is said to have led to a rise in violent crime. And we also see a moral panic around girls' involvement with crime. The idea that when girls are involved in crime, it's especially dangerous or it's especially problematic. For some commentators, feminism <coughs> has empowered girls such that they begin to act like boys. They begin to be involved in crime and violence. However, when you look more broadly, we see that crime among boys is sometimes normalized. It's viewed as a natural extension of masculinity. It appears undeserving of special attention gen or gender analysis, unlike girls' crime. Thank you. So crime is gendered. Criminal activity is disproportionately the domain of men and boys. 
when women commit crime, it tends to be less violent. Men are more likely to be arrested and charged with violent crime than are women. The link between masculinity and violence is something that's been developed in childhood. Boys are encouraged to fight in rough house in ways that girls are not. The saying, boys will be boys, exemplifies the belief that there's an inherent naturalness of male violence. Violence is a socially sanctioned behavior for males, and one only needs to look at the domain uh, or the, the depiction of sports or prisons or look to uh, the military to see the different activities and institutions of that normalization of violence in male culture. What results is the use of violence as currency among men to achieve real manhood, because it proves to themselves as well as other men that they're real men and that they're not like girls and women. These socially sanctioned portrayals, portrayals of femininity, masculinity, and crime serve to reinforce the traditional understandings of gender and crime. Messer Smith, Smith uses the concept of doing masculinity to understand men's and boys' involvement in crime. Hegemonic masculinity normalizes and reinforces the notion that in order to be masculine, one must demonstrate and use aggression and violence or dominance when it's appropriate. When accepted middle class modes of masculinity, such as achieving wealth or status are denied, some boys and men may resort to criminality to achieve an alternate form of masculinity. Thus, violent crime might provide an avenue for some boys and men who are denied more socially legitimate means of demonstrating masculine authority and power to be able to achieve some sort of masculinity. This, in this manner, violent crime may be tied with an alternate form of masculinity adopted by marginalized and disenfranchised populations. Since hegemonic masculinity is not available for all males equally due to race and class inequalities, some marginalized men do difference in order to achieve gender. The inclusion of race and class in an explanation of how one does gender means that an individual's behaviors are intersected by gender, class, and race concurrently. What this means is that gender, race, and class social structures impact and influence how individuals' behaviors are enabled or constrained, so what they're able to do. Thus, while hegemonic masculinity may include a potential for violence, violent crime is not typically considered to be a component of hegemonic masculinity. However, when that legitimate means to exercise authority is denied, violent crime can then become that expression of masculinity. So while gender scholars have demonstrated the link between violence and violent crime and masculinity, this link is some, sometimes and actually quite often obscured in social discourse. It's not something we talk about in media. It's not something we talk about very often in daily life. People talk about social institutions or practices as if they were gender neutral, which then essentially hides the implicit assumptions about masculinity. The same is true in discourses surrounding crime. For instance, if one were to look at the news portrayals of the US mass shootings among students in the United States, quite often, only the fact that their youth is mentioned, not the fact that they are both white and male. Here, the moral panic centers on youth more generally, while not actually focusing on gender or race. Other big moral panics that we tend to see are the ones focused on girls that I mentioned a couple slides ago. These moral panics exist when there's an account of a phenomenon that's distorted and exaggerated compared to more reliable or objective data. So for instance, our crime reporting data might show something that's quite different than what we see in the media. The media will then raise alarm, and to help solidify the belief that there's a particular social problem, 
then oftentimes there's the call for maybe strict punishment or social change or social policy change, maybe tough on crime legislation. The literature on moral panic surrounding youth crime and news media demonstrates the ways in which societal concerns about changing norms, and here we have a particular focus on youth in general, is reflected in media to the extent to which the media discourses around youth crime are generated, engendered. However, as I noted before, very seldom do we talk about the fact that there's a gender discourse about boys going on in these reflections about youth crime. The current study uh, by my colleague Tracy Adams and I, we asked the question, to what extent is young men's criminal activity linked to masculinity in media accounts? Or are young men merely just regarded as these generic gender neutral figures? To address these questions, like I mentioned before, we analyzed about 1,100 news articles between 1991 and 2014 in Canadian newspapers. We chose newspapers for a variety of reasons. First, we thought news stories are the key to understand the big picture ideologies in our society because they're part of that agenda setting process. They also have the ability to raise awareness about social issues, which can lead to political unrest or political change. And then lastly, they have the ability to foster the fear of youth violence. And subsequently, this can prompt policy change or legislative change, depending on the tone or focus of those news stories. It's important to note that not only does news media reflect societal perceptions of, say, good and bad, they also do so for a profit. So now we can see that the, news, the newspapers also have that additional component where they want to be able to sell the fear and anxiety to the public. Uh, and essentially exploit youth crime in the process to generate that profit. But regardless of the motives behind the reporting, newspapers are major players in the distribution of our national news. And to the general public, this is particularly important because it's how we get our daily information or it's how we get our information. So to be able to study this from a feminist intersectional perspective, it's, that's especially important given the gender based and class biases that previous analyses in these topics have actually generated. So our aim was to explore the way boys and masculinity are represented in news media. We identified three linked profiles. The first one being the notion that boys are the universal youth, which I'll get into this concept in a minute. The second being that there's this belief that, oh, boys will be boys, and that normalization of some forms of boy obedience. And then third, the problematization of some types of masculinity. In the majority of news stories, in fact, actually 77% of the news stories, youth crime was discussed using gender neutral language. So quite often, articles made broad statements like, quote, youth crime is on the rise in Canada, making no mention of gender. Even in discussions about specific crimes, the focus tended to be on age rather than gender. For instance, quote, two 17-year-old youths were charged with first-degree murder, or quote, two 17-year-olds uh, that were responsible for shooting Jordan Manners allegedly walked away from the dying boy. One might assume from these statements that the journalist is talking about a boy or a girl. However, later in the article, it becomes clear that the person being discussed or the perpetrators being discussed are actually male. Consider this 2008 editorial on youth crime. Quote, youth crime is on the rise in Canada. The number of drive-by shootings, knifings, muggings, and assaults children commit are now more than double where it was when our national experiment, experiment with every boy a good boy justice system began two decades ago. So the casual use of the word boy in this quote reveals the gendered assumptions about who the youth criminals actually are. In other articles, the journalists primarily use gender neutral language while sprinkling male pronouns throughout the article. For example, there's one article that discusses um, an interview with the University of Toronto professor that was writing for the Globe and Mail stating that the 
the Young Offenders Act fails to properly hold juveniles accountable for their egregious acts such as murder, and that the law requires, quote, 12 to 15 year old murderers to be released after seven years whether he is rehabilitated or not. So through the use of the male pronouns and idioms, the word youth then becomes that proxy for male. An example of this can also be revealed when news stories would talk generally about youth crime for several paragraphs and then happen to mention girls. An example from a 1998 Toronto Star article warned the public about youth gangs. They said that it would be a mistake to assume that all gang members have male faces and that the public should be really concerned with girl gang members. So here, the youth that they were talking about in the entire article were then males because it requires special mention for us to think about girl gang members. So this lack of reference to boys and masculinity simultaneously marked the invisibility of maleness or masculinity in the stories about youth crime while also reinforcing that assumption that crime is inherently a male domain. Similarly, maleness as being, or the articles as being gender neutral, we tended to see almost a race neutral type of representation um, in some of the articles. Race was not mentioned in 80% of the news stories, but there were hints that the universal youth, crime, youth criminal in the news discourse was white. It's believed that Caucasians commit the majority of crimes in Canada, but Caucasian perpetrators were only explicitly mentioned in 2% of all of the news stories. So that's quite a, a small number, which you can see reflected on the, the, the chart behind me. Race was mentioned more often when the perpetrators were a visible minority, and teens of color were explicitly mentioned in 20% of the sample. When we know that, for the, for the most part, articles on youth crime tended to make no reference of race. Even some articles describing a youth wanted for committing a crime were just as vague in their descriptions, simply describing what the suspects were wearing, without actually referring to race. Just as youth criminals were sometimes genderless, they appeared to be lacking in race as well. In contrast, other news stories explicitly identified people of color as perpetrators. For instance, one news article stated that there was, quote, a group of Asian males with a wild look in their eyes as being responsible for an attack. Another headline states, we can't keep tiptoeing around black on black violence. As with gender, it appears the universal youth criminal has no race. The neutrality of both masculinity as well as whiteness meant that the journalists felt that there was little need to actually state when white boys were the culprits of crime, of youth crime. In contrast, the accused or victim, when the accused or victim was a person of color, journalists often mentioned or discussed their race or ethnicity explicitly drawing connections to immigration, the inner city neighborhoods, as well as poverty. Which points to, again, some of the ideas of what causes crime in the first place. I'll take questions at the end if that's okay. When boys were mentioned as perpetrators of crime, sometimes their, be sometimes their behavior was normal normalized as simply just boys being boys. For instance, one journalist causally states, quote, boys have a history of violence. Another suggests that boys are predisposed to violence because of, their so because of social and other forces. Uh, for instance, quote, overwhelmingly young men from teens to age 20 are both perpetrators and victims in a cycle of violence. The introduction of knives and guns to the types of fights that youth have always waged among themselves. Other journalists and experts agreed that boys' predisposition towards violence and aggression was part of their biological or psychological makeup. One article from a staff psychiatrist from a university or from a Toronto high school told a news journalist that the possible reason why two 11-year-old boys beat up or ended up murdering a toddler or beat a toddler to death was because of the unmet biological and social drives, and that the universal need to learn and tame their inherent aggression. Another example can be seen in an article in which 
a journalist asks, why are all boys and men so violent? The answer is then provided in the article saying that males across all living species are prone to violence and aggression. In this manner, many news stories ended up normalizing the violence and aggression among boys, insinuating that a certain amount of violence and aggression was par for the course, and that it was a typical normal aspect of male adolescence. Nevertheless, because the news articles were often talking about these especially violent crimes, it wasn't completely normalized. There was a suggestion that some levels of violence and aggression was considered to be okay or normal for boys, but that today's boys were taking that violence too far. So for those boys that were taking it too far, their masculinity thus becomes problematized. As we have seen, often news articles on crime obscure, obscure gender or saw boys as boy crime as being a natural outcome of masculinity. Many news articles, though explicitly mention boys' participation in crime, some portrayed their masculinity as especially problematic. And in particular, when their masculinity was described as problematic, it was when it was associated with weapons or using violence that involved some sort of object other than fists. It was not uncommon to compare today's youth to the youth of the past and claim exclaim that the danger among these new youth have grown exponentially. For instance, one journalist states that there's been a, quote, an escalation in the amount of violent crimes committed by the past few years among young men. And so what this presented was that while fistfights causing bloody noses and bruises was considered to be normal for boys, boys were fighting with, quote, iron bars, knives, and guns. And I have a large quote here, which I'll read to you. And this is in the words of another journalist, quote, young men are more violent than ever before. Not all young people, not even most. But we know, for example, that some schools in larger municipalities, knives are confiscated daily. Pocket knives, buck knives, machetes, meat cleavers, as well as prohibited weapons, such as switchblades and butterfly knives. Where firearms are rare, in some schools in Montreal and Toronto, firearms are discovered monthly rather than yearly. So here in that quote, you can not only see that they're suggesting that there's an urban element towards the crime, you're also seeing these really probably um, abnormal types of weapons that are being used, but they're being mentioned as though it's <coughs> quite common. I, I, I doubt it's quite common that machetes are brought to, to high schools. In a similar example, a journalist quotes an Etobicoke detective as saying that 14-year-olds doing robberies isn't remarkable for us. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. And that gangs of teenagers between the ages of 15 and 17 attack people with, quote, pipes, baseball bats, and broken bottles, imitation firearms, and pellet guns. These articles display the male youth as out of control and violent with access to weapons. These are the youth that are considered to be violent. Even when making direct reference to official statistics that show a decline in youth crime, there tends to be this perception or um, tone that's written about in the news where uh, police officers, principals, um, teachers, and other people who are working with young people believe that academics or governmental statistics are not reflecting the true picture and that it's just an elitist mumbo jumbo or ivory tower that's saying that crime is going down and they don't know the truth of it rather than actually sort of acknowledging some of the statistics as well. So having access to weapons, the impact of youth, male youth violence has escalated to the point where some boys are seen to be a threat to Canadian society as a whole. Their masculinity has become problematic for society. The depth to this societal threat was illustrated through repeated use of imagery evoking battles, soldiers, war, and extreme violence. For instance, former police chief uh, from Toronto, Fantino, described one episode of youth crime as an ugly confrontation between youth and police where the street became a war zone. Such quotes end up suggesting that the police are the good guys fighting the bad guys or the youth criminals that are using this um, sort of extra form of masculinity with violence. 
this conflict becomes a battle between positive masculinity and negative masculinity. Visible minority youth are described more often than not as being violent and participating in gangs and weapons. This was something that we saw in the data as more common was the association of gangs and weapons with uh, boys that were of color than uh, boys that were mentioned in, in sort of the race neutral kind of way. Some articles explicitly stated that minority youth were a threat, quote, criminality among young black people poses a danger to Toronto. Articles also explicitly linked minority youth to gang membership. In fact, gang references were made in almost half of all of the articles mentioning youth of color. Much of the time, articles linked minority youth and gangs in a more subtle way. This was done by mentioning, say, baggy jeans or hip hop culture, uh, gang tattoos, gang um, signs, hand signs or symbols. For instance, one journalist stated, Quote, many gang members, Latino or otherwise, wear baggy blue jeans or cut off shorts, high top running shoes and loose fitting shirts, and baseball caps worn with the visor towards the back. Often the word gang was tied up with assumptions about both race and class. The youth gangster mentality was depicted as originating from the inner city neighborhoods and it was characterized as being extra brazen. In this manner, youth crime was also linked to urban context and poverty. Youth from the inner city were linked uh, and portrayed as being a threat to those who are living in the more well-to-do suburbs. One article claims, quote, families have traditionally fled to the suburbs to avoid crime, but Peel has begun to exhibit some of the precursors of uh, youth gang violence or culture. In this manner, some boys crime was linked to a problematic form of, of masculinity. Today's boys were considered to be more dangerous than the boys of the past because they had access to weapons. And that boys of color and boys living in poor neighborhoods were seen as especially threatening. In this man manner, masculinity of modern youth, especially visible minority and disadvantaged youth, was what was problematized. So some of the summary of the findings, just summing up the last couple slides that we went through, news media depictions of youth crime is both gendered and racialized. Newspapers often talked about youth as if it were gender neutral, but then they betrayed their own assumptions by then using uh, gendered pronouns and idioms. The universal youth in the newspapers were white, although the, the whiteness of them was invisible. And it was primarily visible minority youth who were problematized as being dangerous and enacting a form of masculinity that was said to encourage gang membership and the use of weapons. Poor inner city youth were seen as potentially dangerous. While some violent crime was linked to boys as being a biological, uh, as being linked to boys' biological tendencies, there was a sense that today's boys take that too far and that today's boys are being more violent than they have in the past, and that they're taking this link to assertiveness or aggressiveness to an extreme. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for the public? According to Kimmel, gender, race, and class are often determined along lines of privilege. And dominant groups are able to almost hide behind a shield of invisibility or a cloak of invisibility for those Harry Potter fans. Hegemonic forms of masculinity become the norm in which alternate masculinities end up being compared and evaluated. In news articles, media granted anonymity to masculinity, whiteness, and the middle, middle to upper socioeconomic classes by leaving those groups unidentified and underanalyzed. The discourse not only reinforced that crime was a male domain, but it also suggested that minority youth are disproportionately at fault. And as a result of the dominant constructions of masculinity and structural social inequalities, that those connections to crime end up being ignored in news media. So moreover, when news media links youth crime with race and poverty, the public is led to believe that certain populations are inherently more dangerous than others. 
The impact of social structures and inequality on crime and deviant behavior remain largely unexamined. We end up not being able to understand the ways that certain neighborhoods are contextualized as being undesirable or crime prone, rather than looking at, say, our systems of oppression or inequality as being potential reasons for this. So here, urban space becomes a site where power and privilege are potentially challenged, but also reinforced by the othering of these quote-unquote undesirable populations, which often, like I said before, was tied to teens of color, immigration, and poverty. So what I want to leave you with is the question, could it be different? In the end, this study highlights the importance of deconstructing and exposing media narratives of crime. Canadian print media often reproduces the social inequalities through news reporting, and news journalists don't provide the context for us to be able to actually gain a sense of what might cause crime in the first place when it comes to young offenders, and what might actually help to alleviate crime among young people. The viewpoints and deconstructions of media are likely especially needed now more than ever, and it's the role of social scientists in talks like this, like a social science speaker series, to be able to question some of those taken for granted assumptions about the world. We can look to perhaps fight for higher journalistic standards. We can critically appraise when we're looking at media ourselves. We can question what we're reading in newspaper, what we're watching on TV. And we can also hopefully dream about a downstream impact where marginalized populations are able to benefit from a shift in norms and a shift from unrelenting stereotypes that negatively stigmatize some young people, while not others. So that takes me to the end of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Did I answer your question? Um, so I was, just, I was wondering about, you were talking about in news sources, that when we're talking about males or <coughs> Should we be pushing for, um, for instance, Hispanic people to be seen as neutral as well, or should we be seen as white and males to be uh, represented the way they should? I think on the whole, what most gender scholars, gender scholars, scholars or inequality scholars would be fighting for would be that we wouldn't, none of us would hide behind that neutrality. That race would be considered to be a race just like any other rather than being something that's hidden or obscure as being a neutral. So rather than highlighting when crimes committed by boys of color, we would also mention when it was white boys committing the crime as well. Does that answer? Whereas the newer version you have to pay for it, but the older version is free. 
do tend to do is listen to CBC as I drive to work. And I have heard what's really interesting is sometimes they're talking about uh, youth crime and they're talking about bullying and they're really delving into the issues of say perhaps sometimes now it's policed more heavily than it was in the past so perhaps it's a similar issue that we've been dealing with uh -huh. and then other times they'll turn around and say the exact opposite saying that it's, it's the worst it's ever been and creating the moral panic so I've actually seen sort of CBC reflect both sides of it but I haven't seen enough to really definitively say but it, it is interesting, especially when you when you look at that after paying attention to the moral panic and paying attention to, on the one hand, if they give statistics, well, on the other hand, feeding into that fear about young people. I, I've seen both with the CBC. Um, I think I like with the series you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, did see that when I, one of the other news articles that I, that I did, or not news articles, one of the other articles that I wrote last year was some girls in the United States. We compared the portrayals of girls in news, both in the United States as well as Canada, and it was always more played upon when it was talking about race, and I believe that whiteness was mentioned even less in the sample about girls than it was about boys. And in those circumstances, we tended to see uh, girls being described as being more like boys. Mm -hmm. So they're adopting a sort of dangerous masculinity that now they're becoming like boys and committing crime too. But it, it too was tied to an urban landscape and, and, and girls of color as being the problems. Mm -hmm. like what really is I think what it does end up reflecting is that it, it ends up reflecting our own internal biases about what we think about when it comes to crime, who is more likely to perpetrate crime, and we end up seeing that reflected in the media. So the journalists probably aren't consciously aware that they're reproducing some of these stereotypes, but it ends up just kind of feeding into what they're already doing. And then as well, there's a vested interest in newspapers selling the papers. So whatever they can sort of make more sensationalistic, they'll play on those fears that society already has. I think there's a hand back there, right there. Just hold the hold the wishing. Okay. Um, did you find some news sources were better than others for us? Definitely. I looked at the Toronto Star, the Global Mail, and National Post. I chose those three specifically because they do reflect different political ideologies with National Post being more far right, Toronto Star being more far left, and Globe and Mail being kind of center left. And although the Toronto Star was better in representing more um, context with regards to youth crime and talking about some of the actual issues like maybe youth unemployment leading to crime, they still did all of the same things as the more conservative newspapers as well. But they did sometimes provide more than say a National Post article would. Mm -hmm. Would you say like the, that white males are being protected in the media more than the other genders and races? Or like does that have anything to do with anything? Well that's what the scholars would say, that to be able to be invisible is to be able to be shielded from that criticism. So the boys that are being criticized for being violent, they're being criticized for maybe taking their masculinity too far but they're not being criticized because of their race. 
So that's where that makes that difference. So if there's a, a boy of color committing crime, we can tie that to his race rather than we aren't seeing that being done with white boys as being a problem with race. I think it depends on sort of what what idea is trying to get out there. There is a lot of concern about the feminization of education and that education is now becoming a female domain where men are floundering in it and that there needs to be a return to allowing boys to be more active in the classroom and things like that to sort of make that more masculine. So it really depends on the type of in, or the type of message that say a journalist or a researcher is trying to put out. But great connection.